Well, well thank you um, for the invitation and thank you to all of you for being here. I know these are um, crazy times, so I, I appreciate you, you know, making time for, for this to work. Um, and I have to apologize in advance. I know having my bed in the background is not the most professional setting, but like many of you, I have um, kids downstairs and so I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> hiding away in my bedroom to hope for minimal dis um, noise disruption. So, so that's what's going on. Um, so I'm going to talk about the p-value of replacing 0.05 with understanding. All right, so this stems from, from really the re reproducibility crisis. So this is a, just a graphic, and then I'll get a little more formal about it. But basically the idea that we're getting really conflicting advice. We find one study hold, um, shows one thing, another study hold, has conflicting advice, um, studies fail to replicate, et cetera. Um, so there's lots and lots out there on this. I'll just give a few um, sampling of links, but you can look into any of this um, in more detail. So half of the studies you read about in the news are wrong. Why most published research findings are false. Is there a reproducibility crisis in science? 90% say yes. Uh, poor replication validity of biomedical association studies amid a sea of false findings, the NIH tries reform. And I just have one quote from there. It is now a truism in the scientific establishment that many preclinical biomedical studies, when subjected to additional scrutiny, turn out to be false. Um, estimating the reproducibility in psychology, they tried to replicate 100 results, 97% of, of which were actually significant originally and only 36% replicated. So all of this is getting at the same idea. This really, really huge problem in, in science, which, which, which seems really huge when I put this together. Now it seems um, a little bit more <laughs> relevant given the really huge problem we're facing, but it is still, still a big problem. Um, th this fact that all these studies people are taking as true, but when, when pushed, um, fail to replicate. So, so many people out there are blaming p-values. So the fickle p-value generates irreproducible results. Um, one journal, a social psychology journal, actually went so far as to ban p-values, which, um, which I don't agree with, but they did that. Um, statistical techniques for testing hypotheses have more flaws than Facebook's privacy policies, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much criticism of p-values out there right now. It's not hard to, to find sources that, that criticize p-values. Um, so I'm going to, to look at this a little more, more formally. So the American Statistical Association, in response to all of this controversy, put out a statement on statistical significance and p-values in 2016. And I, if you haven't read it yet, I highly encourage you um, to go and read it. It's relatively short. Um, but they made really six main points. And I'm going to put them here and then kind of translate them into, into my own words. So this, it says p-values can indicate how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model. I'm going to translate that to, stay, to say, p-values can be useful. P-values do not measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true or the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone, aka don't misinterpret them. Scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. So don't just compare it to alpha or a significance level. And I, I should say the, the text is from the ASA, the yellow bubbles are mine, are mine alone. Um, proper inference requires full transporting and transparency. It doesn't measure the size of it or effect of an, or importance of a result. Um, by itself, it doesn't provide a good measure, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna lump all of these together and say that p-values are not everything. So, so they can be useful, but don't misinterpret them. Don't just compare them to a significance level and they're not everything. There's other things we should be taking into account was basically the message that the ASA put forward. Um, so, so there was a, a response and I, I'm not gonna necessarily read all of this from the quote American, American Statistical Society and I'll tell you why it's in quotes in a second. Um, but we think the ASA did not go far enough. It's time to admit that the era of p-values is over. Statisticians have successfully used them to baffle undergraduates, trick scientists, and fool editors everywhere, but the world is starting to see through the roots. Maybe I'm just going to read it because it's good. Um, we need to abandon this early 20th century att attempt of decision statisticians to control decision making. We need to return to what actually works. In place of p-values, the ASS for American Statistical Society advocates the stop seat of pants procedure. This time-honored and tested method used by the ancient Greeks 
Renaissance men and all scientists until Ronald Fisher came along and ruined things. This stop is simple, direct, data-driven, and authoritative. To carry it out, an authority figure, an older male, by preference, this, these are not my words, reviews the data and decides whether they agree with his opinion. When he decides they do, the result is significant. Otherwise, it is not everyone was required to forget about the whole thing. So this is clearly a spoof. Um, there is no American Statistical Society with this acronym ASS. Um, this was published on April Fool's Day, so this was not meant to be taken seriously at all, but I'm giving this to show that there is, there is some merit in what they're saying, is that without p-values, we don't have a lot of other options. We can't just forget it all entirely and just go back to the days when people just look at the data and decide whether they like it or not, or decide whether it, um, is significant based on nothing. So it's, I'm showing this to say that, yes, there are problems with p-values, but, um, but we need something, something along the lines of formal inference to, to make, um, to guide science. All right, so in response, not to the ASS statement, but to the ASA statement and all the um, corresponding things going on, the, there was a special issue of the American Statistician that came out just last year um, titled Moving to a World Beyond P Less Than 0.05. And there's a collection of 43 papers on the topic. Um, there's, there's a lot of really good things there, um, but if I know time is limited, so if, you're, if you want to just kind of pinpoint the, the editorial um, by Ron Wasserstein, who's the executive director of the ASA, Alan Sherman and Nicole Lazar um, is, is fantastic and really does a good job summarizing the, the conclusions of the papers. Um, there's also two papers specifically um, geared toward education. And then there was a corresponding keynote address at the 2019 United States Conference on Teaching Statistics, which maybe some of you were there for and, and heard, but that's, um, that's where I started thinking about all of this was from this really provocative keynote address. So, in this editorial, which summarizes the, the gist of the whole special issue, it says the ASA statement on p-values and statistical significance stopped just short of recommending that statistical significance be abandoned. We take that step here. We conclude, based on a review of the articles in the special issue and the broader literature, that it is time to stop using the term statistically significant entirely nor should variants such as statistic significantly different, p less than 0.05, and non-significant survive, whether expressed by words, by asterisks in a table, or in some other way. So this is a really big deal and represents a, a really drastic, drastic change um, for, for all of those, uh, those of us teaching introductory statistics. And I, I can sympathize with you. So when I first saw this and heard this, um, it, it, it made me really nervous. I started to kind of, you know, um, sweat a little bit, get a little little scared, because this is really talking about changing how, how we teach introductory statistics in quite a substantial, significant way. So, um, so I'm right there with you, and I, the point of today's talk is to kind of interpret this in terms of the current introductory statistics course and how we might start to move in this direction while understanding that there are challenges and concerns. And I apologize for just reading this, but some of these things I wanted to give verbatim, so it's not just me saying this, but rather, um, rather the higher ups in the ASA. So, so what's my take on this? So what's to blame for the reproducibility crisis? Is it the p-value as so many people think? And this is where I'm sad that you're not here because I would love to have you raise your hands, yes or no, or nod your heads, but... Um, but we're virtual and I can't see you, but is it the p-value to blame? And, and I'm here to say it's not my fault. It's not the p-value that's to blame for this whole reproducibility crisis. If not the p-value, what is it? Carrie, we could actually do a poll if you wanted to. Oh, you know what? I, sh I should have done that, but it's, it's, I just gave away that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, just, Sorry, I was trying to blame, but I should have, I'll keep that in mind if there's another time coming up that that's yeah, useful. and there and there is a raise hand function oh. on Zoom as well. Okay, um, I can't see that, right? I guess I can get the participants over here. But again, if you can help me by letting me know if someone has their hands raised, that Absolutely. would that would be helpful. Thank you. No problem. Um, so, so what's to blame? So, so my thinking, and very clearly the thinking of, of the ASA and the editorial, is that it's not the p-value to blame. 
it's taking that p-value and comparing it to a significant threshold and saying, okay, the p-value is less than 0.05, therefore, we slap this label of statistically significant on. And that's all that the world walks away with. They say, okay, that's significant, therefore, it's true. And I have no, no, no doubt in that whatsoever. Or in the contrast, oh, it's not significant, therefore, there's nothing going on, and, and I, um, there's nothing there. So I think it's really, um, the, not the p-value, but, but this dichotomization of whether it's less than, I'm picking on 0.05, but there's nothing specific about that, whether it's less than any specified level alpha and just calling it significant or not. So, so what's to blame? It's this dichotomization, this black and white thinking, this, um, yeah, looking at the p-value as either significant or not. So it's this student's thinking, um, so you get a p-value, but students say, I have no clue what this is, but it's less than 0.05. And that could be students, that could be scientific researchers, anyone publishing their results. And sadly, um, despite the best efforts of all of us, this is the attitude that, that many, 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 I, was, I hesitate to say, but probably the majority of people out there um, have. So it's this and also, and that's all that matters. So, so this is a big problem. People just comparing the p-value to 0.05 and not understanding the p-value and not realizing that there are other things that matter when you're deeming whether a study is significant or not. So, so this has been a lot of <laughs> kind of doom and gloom so far. A lot of, there's a reproducibility crisis. This is a problem. We shouldn't be teaching the way we are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there is good news. And I'm just going to say in, in three words, we can help. So this is something, this is our area. This is something we can address. So if you look at what's really to blame, it's the dichotomization of p-values. Well, we're the ones in our intro stat classes that are really making this so prevalent. So we can, we can do step, we can do something to reduce this. I have no clue what this is. That's our job as, in, as instructors of introductory statistics. It's our job to help students understand what a p-value actually is. And maybe if they understand, maybe they'll understand Maybe they won't be so tempted to just put a, a black and white decision on it. Um, and that's all that matters. There's so much else in our course right now that isn't just a p-value. And all of that should come into play as well. Um, so, so as instructors of introductory statistics, we are in a very powerful position to help this, this crisis that science is facing. So the, edit, the editorial in the special issue gives some um, direction for how we might fix this problem. Don't base your conclusions solely on whether an association or effect was found to be statistically significant. So don't use p less than 0.05 or any threshold. Don't believe that an association or effect exists just because it was significant. And these are verbatim from the issue. Don't believe that an association or effect is absent just because it was not statistically significant. Don't believe that your p-value gives the probability that chance alone produced the observed association or effect or the probability that your no hypothesis is true. Sorry, I can't see the words, but the chat window is there. Your test hypothesis is true. Don't conclude anything about scientific or practical importance based on statistical significance or lack thereof. So you may notice a trend here, and this is, this is kind of worrisome, but don't, 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 don't. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a little bit depressing. Um, so what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk, um, I promise, is not these, I guess not entirely, but for almost all the rest of the talk, it's not all these don'ts, um, but what to do. So yes, we shouldn't be doing all these things that we know are bad, so what should we be doing? So the rest of the talk is, is this focus of what to do, in particular in introductory statistics in light of all these um, guidelines regarding the p-value. Okay, so what to do in intro stat. And I have a list and I'll take them in turn and then, and then discuss each of them in a little bit more detail or a lot more detail as the case may be. Um, so the first thing is, this may seem obvious, but it's something that um, as a field, we're not necessarily doing a good job of right now. And that's just help students understand what a p-value actually represents. So don't just go to calculating it and comparing it to a significant threshold, but what does that p-value 
actually mean? What does it actually represent? And in order to really get at that, I'm gonna advocate um, completely changing how we're teaching inference. Or maybe some of you are already doing this, in which case, kudos to you, you're already doing this, that's awesome. Um, but if you're not, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this from the framework that, that maybe you're not already doing this. So my suggestion for how to help students understand a p-value, um, which will not be surprising if, if you know me or my, my, my middle slash maiden name of Locke, is to take um, this, this traditional framework that a lot of courses are still taught under, so plugging numbers into formulas to get a t-statistic, comparing that to a, a perhaps paper table of, of critical values to get a p-value, that doesn't do very much to help students actually understand what a p-value is. I'm going to advocate moving more um, to simulate, not moving more to, but actually moving to instead simulation-based inference. And I'll walk you through um, what that looks like with an example. All right, so this is looking at um, if you go to a restaurant, um, comparing whether you're paying individually for your own meal or decide in advance to, to split the meal, sorry, to split the bill amongst the others at your table. Um, so when people go out to eat as a group, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but people either pay individually or you just decide to split the bill evenly um, across everyone at your table. And the question we're going to look at today is if this decision is made in advance, so people know how they're going to pay um, before they order, does it change how much people spend or does it change how people order? Um, and you might think in advance whether, whether this holds true for you or not. Do you tend to order more expensive things if you're going to split the cost with everyone else or cheaper things? Um, you can think that through. You don't have to say out loud, but you can kind of just consider that. Um, so this study was done on Israeli college students. So this doesn't necessarily generalize to um, statistics professors, but they looked at college students um, who went out to eat in groups of six and whether they paid, whether they would pay individually or split the bill evenly was determined in advance. And key here, it was determined in advance randomly. So this was a randomized experiment, so there shouldn't be any confounding between those who paid, decided to pay individual and those who decided to split the bill evenly. So we can, we can draw um, causal conclusions here. All right, so do you wanna see the data? This is where I would, I would like to see you, but. I can sense hopefully your enthusiasm. Um, so this is broken, the data broken down by payment type and the meal cost in Israeli new shekels, which doesn't mean anything to you, but you can see regardless, um, pay, the cost or the amount that people tended to spend ended up being quite a bit higher just in terms of the descriptive statistics among the college students who were told they would split the bill as opposed to college students who knew they were gonna pay for their own meal. Um, so what this says about the human personality, I'll let you interpret for yourself. Um, so the difference in means here is negative 13.63 Israeli new shekels. So the, um, it was higher in the split group by 13.63 on average. Okay, so we just saw in our descriptive statistics that meal cost was higher in the sample for splitting students. So why might, why might this be the case? So there's two possible explanations here. And for those of you who maybe saw my, my talk at US Pass, there's actually three explanations. One of them might be baseline differences, but that's here ruled out because it's a randomized experiment. So, so there's two explanations. So people spend more when splitting, or there's really no difference and it's just random chance. And it's the latter that we're gonna try to explore, explore rigorously with statistical inference. So to answer the latter, or to try to rule out that just random chance explanation, we want to know what kind of results would we see just by chance if there were no difference. And the good news is we can simulate to find out. So, so what does this look like? How do we simulate random chance? So here's the data. We have the cost um, as one variable and then the group indicators, I or S for individual or split. And the first step is to assume no difference whatsoever. So the cost, this column, is going to stay the same regardless of whether that group was assigned to pay individually or to split. Um, so that's equivalent to assuming the null hypothesis um, for in, in just intro stat lingo. And then we just mimic random chance, which in this case was just the randomization into treatment groups that was performed in the actual experiment. So to mimic random chance, we just take all those group labels shuffle them up, and re-randomize into treatment groups. 
And now we have a statistic we might see just by random chance. Um, well, we compute the statistic. In this case, we're looking at the difference in means, but you can compute whatever you're interested in. Um, and in this case, we get a statistic now of negative 2.3. And that's one statistic, one difference in means we might see just by random chance, assuming there is no difference. And we know there's a no difference here because that's how we did the simulation. So that one statistic alone doesn't really tell us a whole lot. What we really want to do is repeat this over and over and over and over and over again, thousands of times, and build up a whole distribution for the kinds of statistics we might see just by random chance. And there are many, many, many um, options out there now to do this with technology. Um, I'm gonna show one that's near and dear to my heart and is freely available online um, with no login required, um, but, but most software packages um, will, will do this for you now. All right, so I'm gonna jump over to StatKey. So this is the home page. We're doing a test for a difference in means. And you have the option here to upload your own data, fi data file um, if you want to, but the um, split versus individual is actually already preloaded, so I don't have to do that. So here you see, I can turn the presentation mode on. So here you see that um, negative 13.63, the difference in means that we saw in the actual experiment. So now when I click generate one sample, it's doing the same thing that I just showed you on the PowerPoint. It's taking all these values of the cost of the bill and putting them all together, shuffling them up, and then re-randomizing them into treatment groups. And here's one random split into treatment groups um, shown down here. It then calculates the statistic from the randomization sample, which in this case is 2.21, and plots it over here um, on what will become the randomization distribution. And with students, you can, you can talk through this more slowly. You can step through this one at a time a couple of times and start to build intuition. And I think it helps students to go through this one at a time at the beginning so they see the original sample, talk through how they're getting a randomization sample, and then the, part, the fact that there's each randomization sample yields one statistic, which is then plotted over here. So each dot here corresponds to one simulated sample. And eventually students um, get it or you, you'll, you'll be okay to move on and you can go ahead and generate a couple thousand samples. Carrie, we've got a question in the chat yeah. um, from Jennifer Ward. My schools are really picky about accessibility like for screen readers. Have you tested stat key for accessibility successes slash challenges? Yeah, so, so that is a huge, a huge, so, you, so Jennifer, you are not the only one by any means. Um, we, it's something that we're working on, but haven't, haven't yet come up with a really good solution for. So Stacky by inherent nature is, is, very, um, is very visual and we, haven't, we, we don't have a good answer to that yet. Um, but maybe if you're, if you're interested or anyone else is interested, email me and that means I will, will keep you in the loop. I won't have a good reply right away, but I know it's a big concern for a lot of people and it's something that we're working on. Um, so I hope to have a better answer sometime in the near future. Not super near because of the coronavirus, but in the, you know, not super distant future. Um, sorry, that's not a very good answer, but okay, thank you. Um, okay, where was I? Okay, yeah, so, so we have this distribution of statistics that might occur just by random chance. And I think it helps if you mouse over any of the statistics um, it relates it back to the randomization sample it came from, which really, I think, helps students get the understanding that each dot here is one statistic from an entire simulated sample. Um, but now we have what we want. We have a distribution of statistics we might see just by random chance if there were no difference between paying individually or splitting the bill. So that's the first step. The, sex, the next step is to see how extreme our original observed statistic is. And note that here we can work with our original, uh, our original observed statistic, not some standardized version of it through a complicated formula, um, because this is all on the original data scale. So our original statistic was a negative 13.63. I'm gonna plug that in here. And that's gonna, oh, there's nothing there so far. I'm gonna generate a couple more so there's something in the tail because it's, okay, there's one. Um, so, so our original um, observed statistic is negative 
The question is how extreme would that be just by random chance? And we can answer that question simply by looking at the proportion of dots in the tail or the proportion of simulated statistics that fall beyond that observed statistic. In this case, it happened to be two out of about 4,000 um, for a tail proportion or a p-value of 0 0.0005. Okay, any questions on um, Stackey before I jump back to, or any of this here before I jump back to the, the PowerPoint? Um, okay, I see a question. You have many preloaded data sets in Stackey. Um, thank you, but how can we easily access what they are, um, the context of the data? Yeah, so, so the, the easiest answer, which I, I didn't, I didn't want to go here because I'm not I'm I'm not doing this as a sales pitch whatsoever. But all the preloaded data sets come from our textbook, so the data the the context there is in is in our textbook. So StatKey is um, is freely available to anyone to use, and anyone can upload um, their own data sets to use. If you want these data sets along with all the context, um, those come from our book. But you're free to so I guess the easiest answer would be use our book. But if you don't want to use our book. Um, you can, you can use that key for free and just upload your own data sets that come with whatever textbook you're currently using. Oh, and, and Danny has an answer. Stat key data will build since a new generation of stat prep little apps. Oh, great. So then that, presumably that will have context um, as well there. Great. Good. Thank you, Danny. Um, and Ambika says, if you don't compare to 0 0.05, what do you want students to consider with the p-value? My students always will say hello. Okay, Ambika, thank you. Stay tuned, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get back on that. Um, Fully sure says the data is also on the Lock Five website. Yeah, so the the data is on the Lock Five website, but not necessarily all of the descriptions of the data. Oh, you know where you can get the descriptions of the data though. I don't I don't know if I'm so we have an R package that includes the descriptions of all the data. So if you search Lock Five data on R. Um, that can give you the descriptions of all the data, even if you don't use R, and that will give you the data, the descriptions and the context and the data itself um, is either in StatKey or, or on the Lock5 website. Yeah, thank you, Felice. Great. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't want to, to go into the book because that's not the point of this, but that, since that question came up. Um, okay. And then Carrie, just, I'm so sorry to keep interrupting you. Yeah, just no, before please, we um, yeah, please. move on, there was one question that got put in the Q&A from yeah. Jeffrey Burke, um, and he indicated that it could be answered at the end of the session if not addressed. Jeffrey, has the, your question been addressed? Can you put um, yes or no in the chat, please? So oh, I can see it now. Yeah, so, so type one and type two errors. Um, so I think I'll, I'll talk about this more when I talk about the dichotomization, but type one and type two errors are really a product of P less than 0.05. And if you're not making that dichotomization of P less than 0.05, then in some sense, there's not as, a, not as much of an issue of type one and type two errors. But I am gonna talk at the end about um, warning students of the dangers of P less than 0.05. And that, that is part of that discussion. So I will, I will come back to that. Okay. Can you type your R package? Yes, I can. Not five. And again, that brings you, you can get a PDF there that describes the data without having to actually load it into R. Okay. Um, okay, let me go back to PowerPoint. All, all really great, question, great questions, everybody. Thank you. And just really quick, quick folks, yeah. quick reminder, um, please, I, I, knew, I noticed some of you are using the Q&A and that's, um, that's fine, I'm keeping an eye on it. Um, but if you are doing or putting your questions in the chat, which is a little easier to monitor, please make sure in that to field you can select individual people, all panelists or all panelists and attendees. Several people have done all panelists, which is fine. We're able to see it, but that's why um, the attendees aren't seeing some of those questions. I believe Rupa just asked that. Oh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, everyone. I, I don't know. I wasn't repeating the questions fully because I was thinking that you could all see the same chat I, I saw. I'm sorry about that for not. No, not, it's okay, Carrie. Um, so just please. moving forward, y'all, just make sure it's all panelists and attendees when you pop a question in the chat. Um, and the chat is a little easier to monitor than the Q&A, so please use the chat. Thank you. And I will also try to pay attention to whether it 
is to all panelists or all attendees and repeat the questions better. Thank you. So okay. sorry to interrupt, Carrie. No, no, no worries at all. Um, okay, so, so this is just kind of in PowerPoint showing what we just did on stat key. So we have a distribution of the statistic if the null is true or no difference. We have our observed statistic. We have the proportion as extreme as that observed statistic, which is gonna be a little bit different because it's random from, from run to run. But if you care about that you know, change in the fourth decimal place, um, you can just do more simulations. Um, so in this case, this is just two out of 3,000. We had two out of 4,000 because we simulated a little more. Um, but that number, that proportion of dots in the tail, that's the p-value. And that's the picture that I want my students to have in my head when they're thinking of a p-value. This, how extreme is your observed statistic? Not is it less than 0.05, but, but how extreme is it? And then you can have a conversation about if it's very extreme, then that provides evidence against the null. If it's not very extreme, it doesn't. But that, I think, comes secondary to actually understanding the p-value. So there's different way we could have gone about this. We could have checked the conditions. These are small sample sizes and it's not, as, not equal to 30, but students would proceed anyway because they don't have another choice. Which formula, they would look through a long list of formulas, find the t-statistic, plug and chug, which requires a lot of um, fluency in algebra, which a lot of our students might not have, and that poses a really big problem. Which theoretical distribution, um, you could get this nice table, degrees of freedom, this mysterious concept that students never understand, made even harder by the fact that what we use and what software use is different, and, and et cetera. Go across the line, find the p-value, learn how to use this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we get something that is the same answer as we got here. Um, but students are left after this saying, what's a p-value? So this approach that so many of us use, um, not through any fault of our own, because that's what everyone did just um, you know, a decade ago, really does not help students understand the p-value. When you look at this, in some sense, it's not the world's fault. And it's not surprising that science, which is based so heavily on p-values, is having this crisis. We're teaching in a way that students can't understand, and they have no choice but to grasp onto that p less than 0.05 in that declaration of statistical significance. Um, so, so let's offer them a better way. So to contrast that with the simulation-based in inference approach, so here's the definition of a p-value, which is hard, I fully admit, it's a hard definition. But let's break it down with what we just did with the SBI approach. So if the null hypothesis is true, so the distribution is centered around the null, and we're starting the simulation by saying, if there is no difference, we're simulating under the null hypothesis. Just by random chance, well, we're explicitly re-randomizing and mimicking that random chance. These are the statistics we would get just by chance. As observed, so we're using, again, the observed difference in means, which is much easier for students than um, a, a complicated t-statistic. And the chance of obtaining a statistic as extreme is simply the proportion in the tail. It's as easy as 2 over 3,000. It's, it's very, very different than looking at a theoretical density curve and trying to integrate out the area and the tail, which is just, it is very hard for introductory students. Um, so all of these pieces become much more concrete, much more tangible, much more accessible to a variety of students um, without, without a strong math background um, under the simulation-based inference approach. And so, I think this slide is, is evidence enough that obviously this is gonna help understanding, but in case you want empirical data, um, so there we use the goals national assessment at Penn State, and the goals came out of the University of Minnesota Stat Ed program. And I picked out here two questions in particular that, that relate to p-values. So able to reason that a smaller p-value provides stronger, stronger evidence against the null, and able to reason about a conclusion based on a statistically significant p-value, in the context of a research study that compares two groups, the national proportion of students who are getting these correct um, is, not, is not very good. Um, and this was the, so at Penn State, we recently switched over to simulation-based inference in four different classes, or sorry, two different classes, um, and I, I'm giving over two instructions here, and I'll talk about these different comparison groups. Um, and our traditional, um, when we were teaching the courses traditionally, they were, they were also not that good, similar to the national averages. And after moving to simulation-based inference, these, were, these just went up drastically, like huge, 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 huge improvements in terms of understanding a p-value. And then just to tell you what these comparison groups are, we made the switch in two different classes, intro to biostat and intro to stat. So both of those comparisons are looking at 
Um, so the intro stat in particular is looking at the comparing the traditional sections with the simulation based sections in in the same semester. But then there may be an instructor bias. So we also looked at two instructor comparisons where the same instructor taught both traditional and simulation based inference. And even with the within instructor comparisons, um, you see the same kind of gains. still huge, huge, huge improvements um, going from traditional to SBI. So there's really no question in that that there's um, there's something here. This is also not the only data set. There's lots of data sets out there now, lots of published papers talking about the conceptual gains um, from simulation based inference. I missed the goals. Um, yeah, so the goals assessment, goals and outcomes associated with learning statistics came out of the University of Minnesota Stat Ed program. It's the same group that created chaos, which maybe you're more familiar with. Okay, so yeah, rad improvements. Thank you, Tony, I like the word. Um, so help students understand a p-value. I think we have a very clear path moving forward um, of a way to go about doing this. Were you teaching both SBI and traditional? So, so no, so I was the, the part of the biostat group and I switched it to SBI, but I hadn't taught the traditional one. So it's really hard to go back. Once you start teaching SBI, it's, it's really hard to, hard to go back to traditional. I'd, I'd already been teaching SBI for a while. Um, okay, so step two in our list of what to do in intro. So going back to the point of the talk. So we've, we've helped students understand a p-value. So the next step is to reduce emphasis on bright line thinking. So, um, so this goes back to the ASA statement, um, the, the first ASA statement on p-values. And it says practices the reduced data analysis or scientific inference to mechanical bright line rules, such as P less than 0.05, for justifying scientific claims or conclusions can lead to erroneous beliefs and poor decision making. Um, and this is what we've been talking about all along, but basically they're criticizing this stark dichotomization. I really like the phrase bright line thinking or a black and white comparison. Um, that's what we're trying to move away from. So we had a p-value of 0 0.0007 um, uh, here in our particular example, or 0 0.0005, depending on the, the run, but very, very, very small. So that'd be way, kind of way down here. That's very different than a p-value of 0 0.049. And in contrast, 0 0.049 is not that different from a p-value of 0 0.051. Um, and, and making this stark dichotomization is really is losing a lot of information and giving a false sense of security. So, so what not to do? This. So take that p-value, compare it to 0.05, and, and just say report p is less than 0.05. So that's what we're saying to try to get away from. And, and I know it's hard, and I'm not suggesting we do this immediately overnight, and I'll get to this at the end in terms of challenges, um, but it's something to at least be cognizant of and, and to start gradually and, and gently um, moving away from in our courses, or at least moving away from emphasizing entirely. Um, next step, so this should be a little bit obvious, but report the actual p-value instead of just p less than 0.05. So this is a very, I wanted to make this point very explicitly, this comes from the editorial, um, but it says we are not recommending that the calculation and use of continuous p-values be discontinued. Where p-values are used, they should be reported as continuous quantities. So they're not saying get rid of p-values entirely, they're saying report the actual p-value not just p less than 0.05. So, um, so taking this, um, so what to do is basically get rid of all of this and just report the p-value. So it's not talking about doing more, it's talking about just, just stopping there and reporting that number. And somehow, oh, I lost the slide. So oh, I think in the edit of this, so there was supposed to be with here, I was gonna bring this back, um, the corresponding graphic that showed this in shades of gray, I'm really sad that I missed it because that's what we want, but we want to be thinking of this not as a stark dichotomization between just black and white, but between, but more as a, of a shades of gray, where it's very dark over here, um, very close to zero, and it gradually gets lighter and lighter and lighter as the numbers get larger. Um, I'm tempted to go in and get that right now um, so you can see it, but maybe I'll do that at the end, um, time permitting, because I, I don't want to run out of time. Um, so there was a question, what are your thoughts of the college board? They say they are moving toward SBI, but they continue to require less than or equal to comparison of a p-value and alpha level um, for students to come to a decision. I personally think that it's high time that the AP stat course has to be 
um, has to be updated and mod modernized um, is my short answer that I think that the AP stat course is pretty outdated at this point. And it needs to be moving beyond the current current curriculum. Okay, so so what to do? Um, report the actual p-value. So next step, interpret p-values in context. So that same quote I just showed you said p-value should also be described in language, stating what the value means in the scientific context. We believe that a reasonable p reasonable prerequisite for reporting any p-value is the ability to interpret it appropriately. So don't just jump to whether reject the null or do not reject the null, um, but actually look at the p-value and interpret the p-value itself in context. So in this context, if paying individually versus splitting the bill does not change meal cost, we would only see differences as extreme as the negative 13.63 we observed in seven out of 10,000 samples. And I think if students are forced to do this every single time, that will go a long way toward helping them really um, internalize what a p-value is actually talking about. Okay, um, do more than just p-values. So p-values aren't everything. Um, they should not be used in isolation. Um, what else? There's a long list of other things, just a sampling, study design matters, context, quality of measurements, external evidence, other studies, validity of any assumptions used, whether they're doing multiple tests, whether there's lots of analytic decisions going into this, the size of the effect, practical importance, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying you have to cover all of this in intro stat, but rather there's a lot of other things that you probably already are covering um, that can also be brought into light when you're trying to make statistical conclusions or decisions. Um, so for this particular example, we visualize the data. You can see visually that there's a really big, big improvement there. Someone said confidence intervals. Yes, yeah, so confidence intervals as well. Yeah. Um, the fact that this was a randomized experiment is certainly important when we're drawing our conclusions. We can look at the effect size. Probably doesn't mean very much in, in Israeli new, new shekels, but that's about four American dollars, which probably does matter for one meal to a college student. Um, we can look at the confidence interval, as Elise mentioned. Thank you, Elise. Um, the assumptions are all met, um, especially because we're doing a randomization test. There are, are no assumptions. Um, they're testing two different hypotheses, so that might matter, but the p-value is so low that it's not, not going to be an issue anyway. Um, there's very few analytic decisions. They're just looking at a raw difference in means. There's not a lot of variable selection issues going on here where they could cherry pick results. Um, there's a very compelling reason that you can understand why it might make sense for the split, splitting the bill to um, lead to higher meal costs. And then lastly, not lastly, but as one piece of the puzzle, um, this p-value can come into play. So, um, so if conclusions are still wanted, and I know for me, um, it's very unsatisfying to not, I think one of my favorite parts of the course is looking at interesting data sets and arriving at interesting conclusions. And it's very unsatisfying to just kind of end with 0. 0.0007 and stop there. Um, so if you still want to move toward, toward a real life conclusion, um, one possibility is to start really extreme. So this is a very, very, very low p-value. Um, and in that case, you don't need to think about a sharp threshold of 0.05. You just say this p-value is very low. Seven in 10,000 is very unlikely to happen just by chance. And you can go even more extreme if you're not convinced that that's extreme enough for your students. So seven in a million or whatever it, whatever it takes. Um, as we've done, talk through the p-value meaning first before jumping to a conclusion in context. Base conclusions on the p-value itself, not on a comparison to a significance level, and base conclusions on more than just the p-value. So as we, we talked about all the other, other things we might bring into play. So Here's it's my, Tony yeah. Has yes, his hand question. raised. Tony um, Lam, Lam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let me allow him to talk, hang on. Okay. Okay, Tony, you should be unmuted. Maybe not. Zoom is being stubborn. The story of everyone's lives this week, huh? Really? Um, Tony, can you put your question or your comment in the chat instead, since this yes. doesn't appear to be working? Should I remove traditional equations from my courses? That is a fantastic question. And so I have, I have two answers to that. My first answer is that I, if, it were, if it were just up to to me or to the stat ed community or to, to you, um, I think there's no, 
I think there's very little advantage to, re to keeping all of the traditional equations. I think some general formulas, such as statistic minus null over standard error, that general idea is useful for students. But having students actually compute all the different standard error formulas by hand, I think there's very little um, pedagogical value in that. Um, but there's a lot of places where other um, where that may be expected. So it might not be reasonable for everyone to be able to cut that entirely. So I think um, that would be on a kind of a case by case basis. I think there's no, no reason you have to keep it from a statistical pedagogical point of view, but more of a, is that expected of you um, point of view. But I think certainly you can very much minimize the emphasis on traditional equations and on the plug and chug algebra and, and kind of like the P less than 0.05, maybe they don't go away entirely, um, but we're trying to kind of downplay them um, in a more gradual point of view. And, and Tony gave a good example of a ridiculously low p-value. Great, thank you. Suicide at higher altitude. Oh, that's kind of a sad one, but good example of a ridiculously low p-value. Thank you, Tony. Um, so here, back to this context, I think all of these together, um, I think is enough evidence to talk about a to talk about a conclusion. So we have strong evidence that for Israeli college students, advanced knowing ahead of time that the bill will be split evenly increases meal costs. And I'm not basing this on any kind of um, declaration of statistical significance, but on really everything that is comes into a good stat class. Um, and then lastly, I think um, we should warn about the dangers of P less than 0.05. Because even if we're not going to dwell on it, it's going to be part of part of the world. And part of that is, I forgot, somebody brought up earlier is the idea that type one and type two errors both exist, and we should be aware of the fact that errors exist. Um, I didn't highlight that here, but that's a really good thing to talk about. Um, and I, the one thing I did want to highlight is this idea that I think it's not so much the sharp distinction, less than 0.05 alone, that's to blame, but the idea that if you do this many, many, many times, and we're sharing a lot of studies rapidly right now, the one that gets picked out, this happens to be 20, there's 5% of that, so one is 5%, the one that gets picked out is the one that's less than 0.05. That's the one that gets published, that's the one that everyone sees and believes is true, and all the rest of these fade into the background and the world never sees. Um, so just the idea of multiple testing, essentially. Um, so I, if you haven't seen this, I really like this as XKCD. I'm not going to go through it in detail um, because I want to save some time for questions at the end, but I actually have my students act this out in class and they're a little bit uncomfortable, and, but it makes for kind of a fun thing. I have them come up and read the different things and then go through and each student says one, we found no link between different colors. So this goes through a whole bunch of different colors of jelly beans. And then you'll notice um, one of them right here the green jelly beans has the p-value less than 0.05 and the rest of the class goes, whoa, and it's a really fun thing to do. Um, but then the idea that at the end of the, end of the day, um, there's this big news article that green jelly beans are linked to acne, but the students saw that it's only because um, they tested 20 different colors and one of them is going to be significant just by chance. So there are challenges and I'm not saying there aren't. Um, I, I feel these just as much as you do. Um, scientific convention, I think, is the biggest one. So George Cobb framed this really well, but why do so many colleges and grad schools teach P equals 0.05? Because that's what the scientific community and journal editors use. Why do so many people still use P equals 0.05? Because that's what they were taught in grad school. So we're kind of caught in this um, circular loop, and it's really up to us, I think, in part, are the introductory statistics instructors to start to break out of this. It's also up to the journal editors, and I know that ASA is working on, on that side as well. So scientific convention, yes. And that's why I think we can't just get rid of this entirely in our courses yet, but rather start moving in that direction gently. Um, thinking is harder than just slapping on a label of P less than 0.05, um, but it's an important enough issue that I think we have to, we have to be okay with this. Um, and then for me, conclusions are really fun and exciting. So I think it, we should still try to, to get at that, um, even if it's not based on a statistical significance declaration. So there are challenges, but I think there's a lot we can do. Um, so we can teach p-values in a way that helps students understand them. And namely, simulation-based inference has been um, proven time and time again to, to, to be a way to help students understand p-values. We can report actual p-values and interpret them in context. That's something all of us could start doing in our classes right now. 
we can do more with all of the other topics we're already teaching. Our intro stat course is not just about a p-value. We can bring in all those other ideas, the descriptive statistics, the study design section. All of those can be incorporated when we're making statistical conclusions. Um, and we can start to warn against, talk about the dangers of, and, and gradually move away from p less than 0.05. I'm not saying we're going to cut it out cold turkey right now, um, but we can start to become more aware of these issues. So, so in short, um, regarding the p-value, we can start, and I'm just going to come back to my title, replacing p less than 0.05 um, with actually understanding a p-value. So, so thank you all for listening. I think we still have, yeah, I, just, I wanted to save time for, um, for open questions. So I'll just let you guys ask whatever you'd like to ask. Carrie, in the Q&A, we have a uh, question from Felice Shore. She says, lots of students, lots of college students lack the number sense to know what should be considered small or a not so small p-value. So how do you address that, even with yeah. the scale spectrum? Yeah, so Felice, that's a really good question and in a really good point. Um, so I think one answer is to start with these extremely, ex extremely extreme, with these very extreme examples. So something where, um, so I have some, I have some examples in mind, I'm sure you do from your classes, but things where the p-value is like 10 to the negative 16th, they're just so astronomically small that, that it would essentially never happen just by random chance. Or, the flip side, p-values that are so um, not even close to, to significant, um, so p-values like 0.8, for example, or 0.4, um, or something where it could easily happen just by chance. So those extreme... To, ...to build up the understanding without dichotomization. And then eventually, of course, not every example is going to be extreme, um, but hopefully once they have that foundational understanding in place, then you can move toward the natural question, well, how low is low enough? And you can say, well, there's this scientific convention, 0.05 is used, um, and you can use that, but with, along with that discussion, talk about some of the potential dangers of that black and white thinking, I think. Yeah, so, so she said, that's just what I do, great, but it's the ones that are not so extreme that leave us hanging. Um, and I think you don't wanna just, I would suggest starting with the extreme and building up the intuition and then moving toward um, giving more formal guidelines um, with a significance level um, after they have that understanding in place. But yeah, I already said that, sorry. Great point, please, thank you. Will the slides be shared? Yes, I, I can share the slides and I'm assuming the recording will be, I guess I won't answer that question, but I, I can share my slides, yes. Um, the MAA will post the recording um, to MAA Connect on the stat prep, um, in the stat prep community. Um, additionally, Ambika, I believe stat prep usually posts these to their website as well, statprep.org. So um, yes, there should, will be multiple ways to get a hold of the recording. And the R package, I just put there lock five data. Sorry, I had sent it out earlier, but to all panelists, not to all attendees, I, I fell into the same trap. Um, and I saw one question from the, the chat from a little bit ago that I didn't get. So maybe the idea that science is, is cumulative. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what, Elise, what you mean by that. Oh, sorry, that was again to all panels. So Elise said maybe the idea that science is cumulative. I think that was in regards to multiple testing. I mean, the idea that just one study might not be enough, but that one study is the starting point, and then you build on that with additional studies, and that's, that's really where science um, shines. Um, and I see, yes, repeating experiments. Thank you, Elise. I'm trying to, the comments are coming in fast and furious. So I'm trying to keep up. Open, other, other questions? Uh, Carrie Felice um, just sent a compliment in the Q&A. This was awesome. Definitely going to have all our instructors watch it and expect a few minor changes to our slides and materials. Great. Well, thank you, Felice. Thank you so much. Can we get your email? Yeah, so my email is right there um, at the bottom of the slide right now. It's klm47, and I will type it into the chat as well at psu.edu. You can also just Google Carrie Locke Morgan. Yeah, and feel free, I should have said, with my email, feel, feel free to, um, to reach out with, with comments or, or questions. I would love to, I love talking about introductory statistics, so I would be happy to talk with any of you um, in more detail.
Is there a name for the, so, so Nicholas asked, is there a name for the randomization you did? Um, so what, so it's called, so there's a lot of different names. So it's called a randomization. So I call it a randomization test. Um, it's also called a permutation test. Although sometimes permutation test can mean enumerating all the possible permutations. Um, it's more recently became known, um, became part of simulation based inference, which also includes bootstrapping for confidence intervals, kind of any of these computationally intensive, intensive techniques. Um, it's also called randomization based inference. There's kind of lots of Lots of different phrases that the same thing goes by. Thanks, Nicholas. Good question. Let's wait and see if anyone else wants to say anything. So there's another, oh, an anonymous attendee. What do you think about the idea of presenting significance as an information? Yeah, so, so this person mentioned minus log P. So, um, so that's a great idea. So the, the special issue that the American statistician came out with um, gave a lot of, particularly the articles and it gave a lot of potential alternatives to p-values. And I think that maybe somewhere in the future, I didn't talk about those here because there wasn't one that, the stats community or the scientific community has kind of accepted as the alternative yet. So I think it might be premature to kind of chew, pick and choose ourselves which of these two um, to do, but certainly um, minus log P has been talked about as, um, as one um, alternative to p-values. And one of the advantages there, I think people said, is that it's not, um, it's not a p-value, it's sorry, it's not a probability, which, which gets away from a lot of the misunderstandings associated with, with p-values. Um, but also it's it's more a little bit more intuitive in, the in, in terms, I don't know if it's more intuitive, but well, the argument there is that you can think about the number of coin flips it would take to get however many heads in a row you would have to get for that to happen just by chance, um, which may or may not be um, more intuitive than, than, than probability, but certainly not as misinterpretable, I guess. So yeah, there have been lots of alternatives presented for what we might use um, instead of a p-value. And minus log p is nice because it uses the p-value, but not on the same scale. So it might get away from some of the pitfalls we've fallen into. Thanks for bringing that up. Oh, hi, Dustin. <laughs> I just saw your comment. Just, I'll just chill in case there are more questions. It's weird to not be in a room <laughs> and seeing you and just staring at my screen. It's a little awkward. Great, thank you. I see a lot of thanks in the chat. Thanks to all of you for, for taking the time. I know it's a very, very busy, busy, crazy time. So thank you, thanks to all of you for taking the time to, to listen to this. I really appreciate your time. And we are almost at time. Any other questions, anyone? Not seeing any in the Q&A either. Well, you can feel free to contact me by email again. As I said, um, if, if you have questions about this when you go to actually try to implement any of it or just down the road, feel free to contact me.
Well, Carrie, on behalf of the MIA, thank you so much. And I know MBK and Danny have thanked you on behalf of the stat prep team. It was really wonderful to have you here. Um, and I will um, send you the recording link um, as soon as it's ready. So you can take a look before we post. Sounds good. All right. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too, Carrie. Thank you. Stay safe. You too. <laughs>